We got it. Uh, so, good evening. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Leanne Littlewolf. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the uh, ACO's uh, co executive director. And previously, I was uh, the economic development director and had moved into that role from an advocate training specialist. So, I've had different roles here at ACO, but um, one of the things a few years ago that I needed to do that I had never done before was write a business plan. And Ego was looking at buying a corner grocery store that had been vacant for a couple of years and uh, we needed to get financing. And so I started to write a business plan and I Googled, how do you write a business plan? And I tried, but I actually, I needed help. And so, um, but once I had that help and I know uh, Mary Lundin's here tonight and she helped guide me through that and help us write a beautiful business plan. Um, but um, I would say that it wasn't, it was intimidating at first, but then it was fun. And so I'm excited about the knowledge that's gonna be shared tonight. Um, I love working with Pamela Standing and she has helped me in so many different ways. Um, so I'm excited about the knowledge and the ideas that are gonna be shared tonight. And I also um, want to say thank you to the partners and our sponsors who made this night possible. So I want to say thank you to Northwest Area Foundation and also to Duluth Lisk um, for helping us um, be here tonight. And I'm going to hand it over to Danny, who is our facilitator for this evening, and um, just grateful for the work that you're doing is, um, um, with your businesses and just uh, wish you the best. Miigwech. Annie, I'm going to just jump in here real quick. Thank you, Miigwech Leanne, for that welcome. Um, we are going to be taking questions towards the end. And what we did was um, I had asked you in this, the registration form to, to submit some questions that you had for Pamela. And so Pamela has the, that list of questions, and she's going to try to address those in this session tonight. And um, there will be time at the end for questions. Um, if you have a question that comes up, you can put it in the chat and I will be moderating that, but the questions won't be answered until uh, the end. So stick with us till the end. Okay, Danny. Miigwech. Um, and just a question, we had uh, one of our attendees said she couldn't hear anything. So I just want to make sure that all the other attendees um, can hear us. Um, but I think Tina's looking into that. And for the sake of time, I will roll forward here. So Buju, I'm Danny Paradis, and I'm really happy that ACO is organizing events such as this one. So this is the business overview for Indigenous and BIPOC entrepreneurs. And we're very grateful and happy that Pamela Standing with the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance, Maniba, is here to share the function of a business plan while identifying critical components that Indigenous and BIPOC entrepreneurs may want to consider in their plan for increased chances at success. So this is for new business ideas, existing businesses, and for expanding uh, to meet a new opportunity. And so this is an entry level introduction to these main business planning concepts. And so Becky, or excuse me, Tina, sorry, our, our Zoom tech, uh, she's doing a screen share here now just to show what we have for our time together. Uh, we will end at about 6.30, but if we have to go over it a little bit for Q&A, that is okay. Um, but like um, Ivy has said, uh, we will be saving questions for the end, but feel free to put them in the chat so we can save them for later. Um, up next, we have a presentation uh, through ACO's Indigenous First uh, Gallery and Gift Shop. Um, we're really grateful. ACO has been a retail and economic trade builder um, in our northern region. So I will pass off the mic to Avery. Thanks. Hi, everyone. We just wanted to hop on here quickly to introduce ourselves. We are the Indigenous First Art and Gift Shop located in ACO, downtown Duluth. Uh, my name is Avery and I co-coordinate the gift shop with Cayman Good Sky. Um, our mission goal is to support and highlight um, Indigenous and diverse artists and food producers and authors. And next slide. Let's see. Oh, no.
You can go to the next slide. I don't know if you can hear me. Apologize. <laughs> Trying to multitask here. I will get this working. It goes up on me. First timer here, y'all. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try to reshare. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> okay. So Indigenous Works works with more than 80 artists, food producers, and authors. Um, that number might be a little bit outdated. We're thinking maybe closer to like a hundred. And then just shown here is a few pictures. We have Tashia Hart on the top right with her new cookbook, The Good Berry. And on the left is Patrawise of Native Wise LLC showing their wild rice and syrups. And we also host um, like food producers and events in our lobby and book signings. So in the middle picture there is Delilah Savage. Um, she had a cupcake sale here a while back. And then we have her fine day of Round Lake Traditions with their applique vests. So lots of great products. And then the next slide is our contact information. So if you are an artist or a food producer or author and you would like to work with us, you can contact us here. Um, our phone number is 218-590-3305 and our email is indigenousfirst at aco.org. Thank you. Miigwech, Avery. I just put their email in the chat, indigenousfirst at echo.org. And so we shall transition now to Pamela's presentation. So Pamela Standing has been instrumental in revitalizing indigenous trade networks in Minnesota and in the Midwest region with other indigenous business alliances. Uh, she does outreach and education. And so I came to know Pamela actually back in 2016 when I took my first business planning training. And what Maniba is really, it's an online directory of native businesses in Minnesota. And so if you have a business and would like to uh, be listed, you can go to www.maniba.org. And so I will put that in the chat. Um, meanwhile, this event is again, a very kind of, uh, detailed but uh, kind of big picture overview of business planning. And so if you need and would like some one on one uh, advising support and are from kind of north central northeastern Minnesota, we have the Northland Small Business Development Center. If you are not in this region, there are other small business development centers that provide business planning um, advising at no cost. So I will put that link in the chat so you can look up one in your region. One more resource to share here, the Entrepreneur Fund is also another good one for one-on-one -on -one advising. And then really there's one, if you're looking for mentorship, that long-term engagement to support you on your journey, there are score uh, business mentors um, actually around the country. So I put that link in the chat as well. So we're really happy to have Pamela here with us. Chi Miigwech, uh, she's got, uh, lots of wisdom and knowledge to share, and she does it in such a beautiful way. So, uh, miigwech, Pamela. I will pass it off to you. Oh, thank you. Um, Osionigara, nuote unole dakwa doa. I'm really happy to be here tonight, and um, I'm I'm really excited about just doing an introduction about what a business plan is and how you can use it and why it's necessary. Um, one of the things, um, you know, why is it helpful to have a business plan and what is it used for? And when I think about a business plan, I think about, you know, when you go on a road trip, you bring a map or you, you plug in all the information in your GPS and um, so that you can get to your destination. A business plan is real similar to that. In my opinion, in my experience, it's, it's more of a living document. So it's a, it's really about, it's, it's you really practicing your theory of change or what it is that you feel that you wanna do, what you wanna bring, um, you know, for your business idea. So it's your roadmap 
to um, getting to where you want to go. And it and it's and it's something that can be adapted because we make mistakes. Sometimes we we um, maybe we need to take a little sidestep. You know, kind of like I always liked when I used to travel with my partner. Um, we would always go off the, the beaten path and we'd go, oh, that looks interesting. And we just would take off, you know, but we needed directions on how to get there and then how to get our way back out. And so it, it's the same thing, you know, when you're, you're trying something that you've never done before and it's really, that's what it's there for. It, it's, it's your map to help you get from point A to point B and, um, and try out your ideas. And sometimes maybe when you take a side trip as like, oh, I'm really sorry that I did that. Uh, it was, that was kind of a waste of time. And it's the same thing with your business plan. It, it, sometimes you think that you have something that you really want to do. And then when you try it, it doesn't work in the way that you first dreamed it or thought it up or envisioned it. Um, some of the questions that were part of this was how to get started. And there's going to be some documents that are going to come to you all uh, that I kind of prepared for you. Ivy will be sending them, but I kind of gave you an outline of the components of a business plan. I also gave you an outline of a, uh, a Canva model, a business Canva model. We've been using those more and more, especially when we're working with cooperatives, because it's a, a kind of a more holistic approach to business planning. And it makes you kind of think about things that sometimes a westernized kind of a business plan model doesn't. It, it kind of, it's more community-based, the business canvas model, in my opinion. Maybe someone else that has experience with it may see it differently, but that's kind of how I've seen it is a, you know, that kind of a tool. So I would say start doing some research. Um, look at the components of a business plan. Find out if there's a local class that you can take and just get yourself introduced to the concept of writing a plan or what needs to go into it. And if you don't feel confident about writing, record it on your phone. Uh, record what your ideas are, and then you can put those into writing. I think sometimes as Native people and people of color, we tend not to feel real confident with our writing skills, but we're great orators. We know, you know, we understand the needs of our community and what, what it is that we want to do. And so sometimes just starting out with recording it, and then you can transcribe it, uh, you know, into that. Um, so I would, one of the questions, one of the comments was, I don't even know where to begin. And I just want you to know, everybody is at that exact same place. When any of us start out writing a business plan, we do the same things. You know, like Leanne had mentioned that, um, you know, she Googled how to write a business plan. And it's, it's a little bit over, it's a little overwhelming at first, but once you kind of find that rhythm and you, sometimes you're learning a, a new vocabulary, just allow yourself. It's kind of like when you start a new job and you know, when you start a new job, how you feel like everything's foreign and it's like, you're hearing it for the first time. But once you've been there for a while, you kind of start incorporating the language of that organization. And then it becomes integrated and it's a part of who you are. And that's what I wanted to say, that's what this will do. Um, someone else had asked, how do you turn your side hustle into a full-time gig? Um, that's a big commitment to do. And I think you, when you do it, you wanna have a, you, you need a plan. Um, it's really important that you have a plan. So that you can, if you need to do it gradually, you can plan it out that way so that you can go, okay, this is how much I need to be earning so that I can make my house payment or my rent payment, that I can pay for my car insurance, I can put food on the table, I can take care of, um, you know, all those expenses a lot of times that we don't think about. And I've seen so many entrepreneurs, they start a business and a lot of times they go in and they're really underfunded and they forget about those other expenses that you have to take care of every month with, you know, if you're raising a family, you have a roof over your head, all those things. 
it, when you do the business plan, you need to think of those things as well. What, what do I need to be earning so I can take care of that other part of my world and that it's covered? So I would say, you know, really start playing around uh, with your side hustle and see how much do you really have to be earning each month so that you, they call it break even, but also that you're able to take care of, um, you're gonna be paying for all the materials that you have um, for your business, but also that then you can start paying yourself, you can start taking care of your own, um, then you can take care of your own bills. Um, there's another question here. It says, our multicultural community garden, the village, which includes 95% African, Asian, and Native backgrounds, is starting a new market this summer. I'm wondering how a business plan will help in our overall success. I would say what I would really encourage you to look into is working with someone that knows how to do an agricultural plan. I thought that somebody at Northland does that because I think they were working with um, Fond du Lac when they were putting people through the Gitagon uh, gardening program there. Um, it's a little bit different, an agricultural plan, a business plan, especially if you're doing value added products, that's a little bit different than your regular corporate, kind of a corporate style business plan. So I would say, look at, that might be something you guys wanna, might want to think about as a collective or a cooperative. How can you all work together and be worker owners together? So I would encourage you to explore that. Um, there's some resources I can share with you. Um, when we get to the, I can send them on to Danny and Ivy and they can get them to you about how to look at those kinds of things and what other kinds of agricultural cooperatives are there. I can introduce you to some of those people in the country that are native led. And there's also some black led um, food cooperatives that are just really powerful. And it's really centered around social justice, around um, equity, equality, and getting food to, um, to our communities. So there, there are some good resources that you can look at. Um, now, let me see, do you want me to keep going, Dami? I think that's great, Chima Gwich. Um, I put in the chat a link to the Maniba papers, and I was also gonna link the Northland Small Business Development Center again, so I gotta do that. And yeah, can, please continue. I think our next section was kind of talking through a general overview of business plan components. Okay, there's a couple, th th there's several different schools of thought on business plans, like the pieces that go into it. So when I think about a business plan, I kind of break it down into sections. And um, the, there's all kinds of ways that you can look at this. So usually in a, in a traditional business plan, you have your executive summary. And, and what's really weird, it's the first thing that you look at, but it's the last thing that you write. Um, you finish everything else, and then you go back and you do your executive summary. And um, so that, your executive summary, it, it summarizes the individual or the group that is... Um, their mission statement, uh, their values and their goals. And it talks about who they are and what their business is. Then there's a section called like the present situation. And that's really a narrative of, you know, kind of the market environment, uh, maybe similar products that are in the area, um, pricing your customer profiles and, and how you're gonna distribute your products. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a, kind of gives you just kind of like, this is what's happening today. And um, let's say that you are um, starting a business like an art business and you're doing really beautiful beaded earrings. So what you would do is you would really look at, okay, what's happening in the market right now? How many different types of bead artists are there that are out there? What are the different types of products that are carried? Um, how are they priced? You know, those are just things to know and, and, and kind of like, who are the customers? Who are the people that buy these products? And then how are those products distributed? Is it face-to-face -face sales? Is it a combination of 
um, you know, a website, uh, selling on Facebook, Etsy, or is it just for conferences or, you know, how are they, how, or is it a combination of all of them? Do they go to powwows? You know, there's all these different ways that people distribute their products. Are they selling it wholesale to someone like Indigenous First and then they're marketing it for them? Um, the other part of a business plan is your objectives. And, and that's really about where you're going and what you plan on accomplishing. So what is it that you want to do and you know, why you're doing it and then where you're going with this and, and what you hope to achieve. Then you go into like management and organization. And this is a place where you, if, if it's one individual or if it's a group of individuals that are working with you, this is where you put in your resumes. And if you've taken the time to think it through, like when I did my first business plan, oh my gosh, you guys, it was back in the 80s. Um, it was so, we worked on it for six months. It was really a comprehensive document when we got done because we were taking it to a bank because we had a lot of upfront expenses uh, to run the business. So it wasn't something where we could do, kind of do it really slowly and kind of reinvest our money back into the business without getting a loan. Ours was one because we were doing international business and that kind of requires a different you know, step. So we had all of our policies and procedures in there so that a banker could see, an investor could see what we were doing um, we had all of our policies like hiring and firing, sick days, family leave, uh, ceremonial and gathering leave, uh, death of family members, how we, you know, how we address that compensation. So like for salaries, for contractual workers, uh, training and credentials, um, kind of what we're going to do in house, what are our training strategies and programs that we're going to provide to the people that work with us. And then how are we going to is, is this something where we would utilize paid interns? I know a lot of people, they, they see interns as free labor, and I just want to encourage you um, not to do that. So if you do have opportunities to get an intern, budget some money in there that you can pay them. Um, because it's, I, I just think it's a practice that's been abused. And that's my opinion again. Um, then you go into your products and services. That's your next section. And you talk about your product line. Also, one of the things that I've seen over the years when I work with new businesses is that they only have one supplier. And you have to really, um, like even with beads, I'm a bee, I like to do bead work. And there have been beads that I just love. I, I use those uh, Japanese um, beads, that, number 15s. And I'm really picky about the colors that I like. And you get, you kind of get hooked on something and you have, you're used to this product and then all of a sudden it's not available anymore. So you always want to have a couple of backup suppliers. And because there may be times where they can't get a product. Um, I make jams and jellies and I buy 10, 10 dozen jars at a time. Well, there's been a shortage of jars in the US since COVID. And the jars that I like to use and the special canning lids, which are a one piece lid that I like to use, I can get the lids, I can't get the jars. And then I can't get the lids in the color that I always liked before. Now I can only get it in white. And, and, you know, so it's kind of be prepared for those kinds of things and really do your research because you want to have a good group of suppliers. You want to have your, you know, A, B, and C. <clears throat> and then in that segment of the plan, when you talk about your um, products and services, this is where you get into your policies about, you know, depending on what you're doing, um, we were doing a kind of a manufacturing and um, kind of a partial manufacturing of computer products. And so we had to have purchasing and receiving procedures. It was kind of our quality assurance plan. Um, we had to know that when things went out the door, but also when we received partial goods, how are we checking those to make sure that they meet our quality standards? And so if you get those established up front, 
because I think one of the things that happens uh, with, with all of us as new entrepreneurs, we plan to do disaster recovery planning. You know, we wait until a disaster happens, then we make a policy around it. And so my feeling is start up front and do as much as you can so that you've kind of, you've covered all those what ifs and you're, you're never going to cover all of them. But at least you've you've kind of what if your you've what if your plan, so you kind of almost play. I don't know if this is a good word to use, but people use it as an expression. But you're kind of you kind of almost need to be a devil's advocate with your own business plan and and look at it like, well, what if? So one of the things that you want to have is your you want to have clear documentation for how you order and who you order from. You want to have documentation for receiving goods against your purchase orders. And I always encourage people, even if it's the date, start getting in the habit of giving a purchase order when you're, when you're in business. It helps you keep track of stuff. And especially if there's a bill that comes and you don't have an invoice to reconcile against that bill, and that'll happen sometimes. So this is kind of your way to cover, you know, cover yourself. Have a develop a return and exchange policy. Know what that's going to be when you start your business. So let's say you, um, some people will repair products. Like we have something at home at Cherokee Nation where when people buy these beautiful, their double wall weave baskets, we have master basket weavers there. So if somebody breaks a basket or something happens to it, they can send it back. And we've got master basket makers, weavers that can repair these baskets and you wouldn't even know, you know, that it had been damaged. So have a plan of, you know, especially if you're doing handcrafted items, what's going to be your return policy? Um, if somebody damages it because they didn't care for it. Um, and that's another thing. If there's special things that you want people to know about your product, give them information on how to take care of it and how to care for it um it because people will do some crazy things like they'll buy a beautiful piece of fine art and they'll hang it in a on a wall that's facing west or facing south and the whole beautiful art piece gets completely bleached out so those are kinds of things you want to let people know you know if you're dealing with that um, I always like to have an inventory control. So I have a way that I look at my inventory. So let's say you're working with beads and um, you know that when you get to, like you have a kilo bag left, it's time to reorder. Um, you know, if your findings are getting low, you kind of set a standard so that you know when you're automatically gonna reorder those things so you don't get caught. I've met so many people and even we're talking about office supplies, like if you have an inkjet printer. Um, I, and I, I was working with a person, a business that he had a, oh, it's where the ink gets embedded into the fabric to make t-shirts. Well, he didn't have a, he got a huge order and he didn't have extra cartridges. So he had another big order and he couldn't finish it because he hadn't, he, he wasn't checking his own inventory and, and getting it on order, you know, like he should have. He ended up having to wait, like, I think it was almost six weeks. And he lost, he lost a part of an order from someone because they couldn't wait that long. Um, and then I, you know, I always created a tracking system for ordering so that I could keep track of stuff and make sure that it was coming in like it was supposed to. Or if there was a problem, I just had a way that I could do a reminder to get back in touch. Um, I just had something happen, I placed an order and they said, oh, it's gonna ship in two days. And then a month later, I don't have my product. And um, something happened with the payment and they didn't communicate with me. So I had to get a hold of the bank and it, it held up getting this really important equipment that we need to do photo shoots. Um, we had to cancel a photo shoot because the, the equipment hadn't come in on time. So things like that, um, establish shipping and, and um, packaging standards. How do you want to protect your product? Like I was looking at Indigenous First, they have things in glass jars. Well, you need to establish a way, a standard that you're going to pack those products and take care of them. 
and um, and how you're going to ship them. And especially when you're shipping art, you want to be very, very careful um, how you ship like a fine print or a flat, just an individual print or um, how you're shipping clothes, what kind of things you're wrapping it in. And, you know, like good art requires acid free paper. And a lot of people don't know that. And then they wrap it with regular paper and it can actually damage the, the artwork. It can damage the color on the beads. And so it's things like that to establish those standards so that you've got them. Um, the other piece of the, your business plan is gonna be like your equipment and facilities. And not everybody, most of us work from home. So our, you know, our worldwide headquarters is our kitchen table in our house. You know, it's our secret lair in the volcano, so to speak. And, um, but, you know, you have to look at what kind of things are you going to realistically need to run your business? What is it going to take? And so those are things you build into your plan. Do you, you know, phone, computer, software, do you need a printer, uh, packaging? invoices, are you gonna have brochures, uh, letterhead, envelopes, business cards? Um, if you're doing artwork, do you need display cases? Uh, boothing supplies, so if you're a person that goes out, do you have kind of like a kit for your boothing supplies and what's in that kit? So we have like these photo boxes. So when we go out and do photo shoots, each one of the photographers that works with us, they each have a box. And that box has all kinds of um, kind of accessories to shoot different types of items. Um, and then the other thing that you're gonna wanna have is, uh, you know, like, do you need decorating space? Like, do you need a place that you wanna decorate? Do you need other kinds of tools and equipment? What are they? When you buy them, is there, do you need to get warranties, like extended warranties to take care of them? Um, what is this going to cost? What's kind of the life of the product that you're, that you're getting? Do you need a desk and chair? Um, some people don't, some people do. Um, and then, then the next section is your market analysis. And that really tells, that really talks about your, um, well, we'll get into that in a little bit because she's going to have me cover that. And then the next session section is your marketing strategy. And so within that is like publicity, promotion, your merchandise, how you're going to distribute. Is this going to be direct sales? Are you going to do, are you going to be calling people and telemarketing? Are you going to be using a marketing representative? Are you going to be using a website, social media? Um, are you going to do catalog sales? Are you going to go in with other people? Are you going to use a retail, uh, you know, like wholesale to a retail space? Um, are you going to sell internationally? And then the other part of your marketing strategy is going to be your market research, your pricing, and that covers like your retail. And you want to think about, uh, it depends on the type of work that you're doing. Um, it's, I think it's kind of hard for artists uh, to be, because they create one piece at a time. But if you're doing something, let's say like the collective with the gardeners, Maybe you guys have a quantity break where somebody buys so many lugs from you, they get a different price. Um, and then are you gonna have a wholesale price for people? And then the, the last part of your business plan will include your financial projections. And that's where I really encourage you to work with someone and really learn about your numbers because your numbers tell your story. Um, it's really, really important because that is what tells who you are and how you're gonna do what you're gonna do. And, um, and then in there, you do your projections. And again, that's kind of like your big dream that this is what you're hoping that you're going to accomplish. So you project numbers of what you think you can do. And sometimes after a year, you have to go back and maybe scale it back. Or maybe your business grew way a lot quicker than you planned. And so you've got to, got to grow it up a little bit. And then you have your assumptions. So assumptions are really important. Like when I do financials, but like when I do an annual budget for Maniba, I have assumptions off to the side so that people understand this is how I came to this number. You know, I didn't pull this out of the air. 
there's a reason behind why I felt it was important to include it. And that really helps people understand your business, but it's also for you because then you own all those numbers and you're just become fluent. And then the last thing is your appendix. And the appendix is what holds any backup data, any, you know, any articles that maybe you referenced in your business plan. You want to put all of that at the very end of your plan. So that's the components. And I think I went over my 10 minutes, but I, I had a few minutes left. Um, so Danny, just let me know. Do you want me just to keep going? Bonjour. Yeah, no, that was fantastic. Um, I think if you have time, we do have time, if we could move towards, um, I, I think those procedures and policies are great. Um, in thinking of, you know, feedback I've heard on other business plans is, you know, how do you make it convincing with talking about business, your business, you did touch on it a little bit, but if you could go into more detail on business management and organization kind of sections of a business plan, talking about team members, you know, skill sets, um, and how to build out, you know, those support professionals that we all need, um, like a tax accountant, that type of thing. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Well, what I would say in that, in that section of the business plan, and I wish I had a business plan to show you, um, that would really help so you could actually see it. But when you're getting into like your management and organization, um, and again, this is, this is like if you're taking that plan to do, I, I think you can scale these up or scale them down, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. But if you're going in and you're looking at, a, you know, um, getting yourself indebted uh, to get your business up off the ground, and I don't recommend that, always starting out of the gate, I don't think you have to go in and get a loan for every type of business that you start. There's ways that we can be really, um, I think as Native people, we kind of know how to kind of put money back in and reinvest it, you know, for what we're doing. But there, sometimes there's a point where we will, um, you know, where you will need a little bit of pocket change. You know, you need a little bit of upfront cash. And especially when your business is starting to grow, you kind of get in this point where you're not big enough yet to pay for everything, but you need the help, you know, to kind of launch. So what's really important when people are looking at you, they want to know that you've thought everything through. So um, in your, you know, in your management and, um, and your organization and kind of your operations, what, for instance, what we did with ours, we had an accountant that we worked with and he was a small business accountant. That's what he specialized in. So he really worked with me on all of my projections and, and really you know, not only was he a great accountant, but he was also a coach and a mentor. Um, we had an attorney. Um, that was something that was important for us to list there. Then we had people on the team that kind of came in and out of our business planning, and we added them in their resumes. And sometimes maybe you hire somebody just for a short term period of time um, to have them come in and help you. Maybe it's somebody helping you build your website or getting these things up and going. And people will look at that and go, okay, they've really thought this through. They're, um, they're really thinking about all the things that they need to be doing to get this business up. And um, you know, what I do wanna say is, I've worked with so many businesses over the years. Um, I've probably been doing this for 30 plus years. And I've seen businesses that thought of everything and they didn't leave one stone unturned and their business didn't make it. And then I've seen people that they, you know, they didn't do as a thorough, but as their business grew, they had to become more thorough. And so it, it just kind of, it, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule for, um, for businesses to thrive or businesses to just kind of stagnate. Um, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong, there's just, I do feel that planning and thinking it through 
is really critical. And even if you just do it for the exercise, because sometimes I've had some crazy ideas and I thought that they would be money makers and they weren't. And, you know, they, um, but I tried them out. And, and sometimes that's what we have to do. We just have to experiment with some of our concepts and some of our theories. And if it's not putting our home or our family at risk, um, I think doing it on a really small scale is a good way to kind of launch an idea and see if, see if it's really going to work. And um, I did something with Maniba, I don't know, four years ago. And I thought this was just going to be the biggest seller. And it was, uh, um, we did an annual uh, business, uh, oh, dang rabbit, I can't think of what to call it. But it was your calendar that you carry with you. Well, you know, I'm an older person, so I'm 68. So I'm not, most people now, they keep their calendars on their phone and they don't carry, you know, a planner with them anymore. So I thought, oh, we're going to do this planner. This is really going to be great. It's going to be a way that we kind of get our message out. And it was not successful. And we did not, one of the things that um, when we did it, and I'm just going to be really honest, I didn't have a real solid marketing plan. And that was my mistake. Um, not having a good plan and kind of knowing where are those people that are going to buy this. And um, so that was a lesson for me that here was something that I thought was really beautiful. We, we really had fun putting it together and the team was all really involved in it, but it just did not take off like we thought. So the, those are things where I think if I would have spent some more time, like really doing a deeper dive into the research and the market analysis, I would have seen that this is probably isn't the best time to be doing that. And we could probably be looking at some other way of um, helping to generate revenue for our business um, outside of this tool. So let's see here. I think that's a really good segue into our next part and talking about financial projections. So I see them as, you know, you're able to experiment with the concept to see if, you know, that marketing uh, strategy is fully developed and investigated, um, how you can use financial projections in advance of, you know, going and buying all the materials. Um, but can you walk us through kind of, and I love how Pamela talks about, uh, about money matters. Um, in a good way as uh, Niji or Native peoples. Um, so yeah, and then we did have a question. We have a, a few questions on you know, financing from the registration. Um, some of them are, are a little specific so we can refer you directly to one-on-one -on -one support. Um, but one question is you know, how, how to get started and how do we know how much money I need to start with? Maybe the financial projections, you could talk to that. Oh. Boy, and, and, and again, that's really dependent on the type of product line that you're launching. Um, you know, like when we did the, the planner, I think that we had, I had the graphic designer's time, then I had the printing. And I think we printed, I think the first time we printed like 200. And so I, I was being risk adversive, you know, as far as not like doing a thousand of them, which I'm glad I didn't. Um, but I think it just depends on what type of business that you're going into. And then, you know, like I think about the gardeners because when you have food products, there's a shelf life on those things. And so what do you do with it if it doesn't sell right away? What, what do you have a backup plan? Can you make it into something else? Um, you know, because things go bad, you know, like when you're talking about produce and, and live things, uh, they, they've got a shelf life. Um, you know, like, I think a lot of it also, I, I guess what I'd say is I feel a lot of it depends on what does that person want to get out of it. And so, you know, um, I do beadwork and I work with leather, but I really do that for to make gifts for my family. I don't do it to make a living. I'm too slow and um, I take a lot of time in what I do and I could never get compensated the, the actual amount of time that I had spent into an item. 
um, I did briefcases with Pendleton fronts and then I beaded the top and, you know, I did a braid and, and I mean, it was, it, boy, my fingers were just raw when I was done with that. And um, I mean, they're beautiful, but I thought that I could sell them, but they just, the amount of time that I had in them, I could never recover my time. So I think, you know, it really depends on the product because sometimes making earrings, let's say you sell a pair of earrings for a hundred dollars. Well, how much time do you have? First of all, the cost of the materials to make that pair of earrings, then it's um, how much time does it take to make that pair of earrings? And what are you, what are you willing to pay yourself per hour to make those earrings? And, um, you know, so those are the things that I think people have to look at in their projections. And I, I mean, I'm making it a really small example, but that's the best way um, to kind of think about it. You know, if you're selling a widget, uh, what does it cost? Like, first of all, if you're gonna buy it and maybe you're gonna, um, it's gonna be a value added, you're gonna do something to it. So you have to think of the cost of the product the cost of shipping the product to you, then what you're going to do to enhance that product and uh, make it into something else. And then all of your packaging. I mean, there's all these components that go into your projections that have to be included. And th that's where I think that it's, it's in the details um, that you really, you make sure that you've got all those things covered. Um, we, we did these winter gift giving boxes this year and we bought directly from the artists. We paid retail because this wasn't something for profit for us, but it was a way to get these artists out in the public. And so we had to buy the boxes Then there was labeling. Then we made these hitchhiker cards on each artist so that people could, there was a little bio and a color photo of them. And it, it was really well done. And then a way to connect with them. And then we had to buy acid-free paper and acid-free stuffing and um, you know all these little things to make it really beautiful when you opened up your box when it arrived to your home. And so all of those things had to be figured into the costs along with what we paid for the items you know, to come up with, okay, what are we gonna sell them at? And what, what do we wanna recover? You know, So we included the cost of shipping it to that person. And, I hope I'm answering that, Danny, the way that you're hoping. Miigwech. Um, yeah, and I love the way um, you do the storytelling with, you know, it's like real lived experience. And um, thank you so much, Pamela. Um, and just as like a little synopsis, so we have Mary Lundeen. She's a consultant with Northland Small Business Development Center. Um, she sent me a message just to share like very, very quickly, and I'll put it in the general chat as well, working on financials. Uh, just basically create create a list of the things you think you need. What are they going to cost us? And then you work on, okay, what are your monthly sales going to have to be so that you can cover those expenses? And then add a little bit more on your sales so that you can pay, um, keep ourselves paid. Because like Pamela said, you know, I, I know this very too, too well as of today as an entrepreneur. Jumped into it. Uh, you know, they say leap and the net will appear or leap and your wings will spread. And um, I haven't quite hit the ground. Thank you, creator, for letting me still be here. But um, I did not consider other ways of paying my own bills, we'll say household goods. And sometimes, you know, in our um, in our way, we, we share our time, share our knowledge and our, our wisdoms and everything, every which way and volunteer because we're all in this together, right, to build each other up. Um, but then I forget, you know, I have to get shoes for my kids um, and things like that. Food on the table. Thank you for SNAP and food stamps and all those other resources that help us make it when we're in these beginning stages. Um, so really definitely make sure, you know, I just, just from personal experience, I don't want to be harping on it too much anymore, but make sure that you are very well supported and um, just want to refer folks to also to ACO. Indigenous artists and um, food food producers, um, they are very willing to help and work with you, you know, and, and get your products in their store. And they are building the market rate, a very fair uh, market rate for those products so we no longer have to undersell ourselves. So um, this has been fabulous, Chi um, And I just love the way 
Um, and I wonder too, if this is a nice kind of segue in talking about, um, you know, the, the values of, uh, you know, our businesses as BIPOC and Indigenous people yes. um, and working yes. those into a model or, you know, however um, you want to explore that with us. Well, and one of the things that for me, um, for all my life, um, I really challenge these systems uh, because, you know, th they always talk about keeping you separate and, and it's kind of like putting you in boxes and we're holistic people. And we live our lives that way, you know, we're interconnected. And so I really started when I was a lot younger, I really started challenging this, like, how can we build a business plan that isn't a white model that is that really speaks to our communities and the needs of our communities and the values. So one of the there was a question that came about when creating a business that centers BIPOC communities, how do we keep BIPOC in the forefront of all aspects. And my answer to that is if you have an advisory committee, make sure they reflect the communities you're serving. So maybe in the beginning, you have a group of people that are kind of, they're there as your backup and kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they believe in what it is that you're trying to do and launch. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, is that I really believe this and we practice this in our own organization. We are, we're probably about 90% native led. And so that includes when you say that you're, you know, that you're centering around your own community, then your senior leadership, not just your lowest paid employees, but everybody up to your senior leadership leadership should be reflective of that community that you're serving. And then there was another question, um, you know, like how do we work our traditional principles, like the seven grandfather teachings, um, you know, and and what helps us to happen and, and you know, how is there a difference in your business plan if you want to stay small and exclusive rather than grow big and mass produce? And I, I wanna say yes, yes, and yes. Um, first of all, I think it's down to the individual to determine what success is. That is a very personalized term. And when we kind of take, when we're judging ourselves on what we see on the outside, we always come up short. So success is really needs to be very personalized and to, to the person that is running the business. Um, and I do believe that there's a way that you can stay small and exclusive. And there are people that wanna have a big business and mass produce, and that's fine. Um, but they do require different types of strategies. And maybe if you wanna stay small and exclusive, you may have to have another gig to support that being small and exclusive, um, but you can still do what it is that you love, you know, that you're passionate about. Um, I can't speak about the seven grandfathers teachings because I'm not Anishinaabe, but I can say you can integrate your cultural life ways into your business plan. Um, and that you, that you have the right to define your protocols and, and always be mindful of wherever we go and when we're speaking up and speaking out that we're representing our community. And so practice being a good relative and try to celebrate other people's accomplishments. And, um, you know, we, we're working with artists right now and and, you know, people go, oh, yeah, competition and jealousy, they're always there. But I think we can heal from that. That's a part of historical trauma. And that isn't how we've operated because we've always been cooperators and collaborators and we've worked collectively. So it's about, you know, I, I try to encourage people by native or by POC, whatever, whatever it is that you want to support and help promote them and their businesses or enterprises and let people know about them. And, and don't be afraid because when we help other people, we're helping ourselves and it helps us to grow. And, and again, it goes back to being a good relative. Um, I, I know that we're running out of time. With. We are almost at 6 p.m. I think we can definitely, we touched on a lot, or you you led us through a lot, Chi Miigwech, Pamela. Um, we can open it up to Q&A. 
Um, we have had a, a few questions in the chat already, and then one just now. So um, all attendees, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and some, if they are specific, um, we will do our best to either gather information on our own or refer you to those one-on-one -on -one resources to really um, strengthen the, the support and feedback um, that you get. So uh, one question from the chat was, do you have any recommendations on an invoicing program, question mark, or apps, question mark? So I had just put in the chat quickly, I've heard of folks using QuickBooks online, and then I know that there's an app that goes along with that, but if you have any recommendations for invoicing programs. I use QuickBooks, so it, it's, it's affordable, it's easy to use, and it tracks, it, it, you know, it, it does an aging on invoices, on outstanding invoices, so that you can keep track of, you know, are we at 45 days, are we at 60, are we at 90, you know, and you have to kind of have plans for that too, when people don't pay on time. And there was one thing I just wanted to mention is that depending on the type of business that you're going into, and again, it goes back to that area of management in the organization, Let's say you're going to become a consultant. There may be some special licenses or insurance that you need to carry. Um, so really do your due diligence um, in your industry, whatever the industry is that you're looking at. Um, find out, do I have to have a special license? Do I, have to, um, do I have to carry a special type of insurance? So there's, uh, and, and it can get expensive and you're going to want to make sure that you have that, um, that you have that information um, when you go to do your financials. You, you want to find out as much as you can and um, to make sure. So Danny, go ahead and ask the next question. All right. I'm going to ask the next two. They're not necessarily related. And then Tina, our Zoom tech offered, if anyone wants to raise their hands, um, she would be able to unmute you too if you wanted to ask your questions directly to Pamela. Pamela, excuse me. Um, so the next question is, what if we're looking at doing a business around art and film or creative consultants agencies regarding uh, representation in media and BIPOC? Um, let's see. Not sure if that question is fully phrased. Um, there was something like that in the document that you had sent me um, about, I mean, I knew we weren't going to be able to get very far because, I mean, I just could barely cover, uh, you know, the, the part about just what goes into a business plan and what to think about. Um, I saw something about a gallery um, wanting to establish an art consulting performer, what I would do is I would speak to other artist consultants and performers. That's going to be where you're going to learn something um, is really uh, look at some other people that maybe you're not going to be in direct competition with, but and, and sometimes it can even turn into a partnership with them. So don't forget that those other people that are in business, um, you know, just be careful. I mean, be mindful of calling people and talking to them and just saying, hey, I'm looking at doing this. How did you do it? Or you could pick somebody that's a performer, but they're in a totally different field than you are. And so then it's not, they may be, they may be more open with you. And that's what I've always done is I always call and talk to other people that are in a similar uh, vein. Um, and then someone asked about starting an art gallery. That again, I think you need to speak to people that have started them and, uh, you know, what you, you know, find out what they had to do. And if there's one of the things you want to be really careful of is, um, you want to have the right kinds of insurance because you're going to have theft. That's just common when you have business, you may have damage. You've got to be able to protect everybody's art that you're taking care of and that you're a good steward of it and that they've, the trust that you've established with them, you can maintain it. 
The other thing is, is uh, be real careful of um, how to, you know, be careful about not taking everything on consignment because that can be really costly for an artist and you'll, you may end up losing artists if you're doing work on consignment. So, and there's, there's logistics with consignment and there's agreements. One of the places I would tell you to go to is I would contact Springboard for the Arts and I would talk with um, Andy Sturdevant and that, that's, he's with the, uh, the Lawyers for the Arts and Humanities and if he doesn't have an answer, I know he could direct you to someone where you could learn that answer. Um, okay, now that somebody had a question about virtual payment apps. I also want to warn everyone about this. This year, people, the government, uh, people are being issued a 1099K. So they are tracking the money that you're making. And I know a lot of Native artists think, oh, this is kind of invisible income. Well, it's not. So be really careful uh, about that because uh, it is being followed. Anything with PayPal, Etsy, Venmo, um, any of those, uh, Facebook, any of those kinds of payment apps that people are using, it is now being tracked by the government and you will get a 1099 and you will have to pay taxes on that money. So I think a lot of people have thought that it's kind of a hidden economy that they're working with and it's not hidden anymore. So be prepared for that. And that's the other thing when you're an artist and you're, you're working on a cash business or you know, you're, you're doing uh, virtual payment apps, uh, make sure that you, um, yes, and someone said even personal accounts, you're gonna, you're gonna have to pay taxes on that and that's something else that you'll have to put into your financials uh, you know, to budget for. Because a lot of times when you're an individual artist, you don't form a corporation as an LLC. Usually you're doing business as. And then I saw someone asking about the, the I call them the NASIS codes. Um, usually that's, I, I think there's a couple different reasons why you use those. We use those for international business. It was really important because it classified the, the products that we were shipping overseas. Um, there used to be a different name for it until, when, until they came up with that North American um, kind of that consolidated system between Canada, U.S., and Mexico. But um, yes, you can use those too. Um, that's you know that's a good a good tool. And then there was something else that there was another question. I don't. I, I There's really, a couple here. I have notes of. Okay. Um, the next one I have is, hey, does anyone know of any native business directories? Oh, we have one um, at Maniba. And actually, if you guys are just a little more patient with us, we are launching a national directory. And we are, um, this thing's got all kinds of bells and whistles. It's so cool. And we've just been working out some bugs. But you'll be able to have your product on there. It'll have a pin on a map so people can see, uh, you know, where where the products are. This is for native businesses only, um, and they do have to be an enrolled member. They they have to provide proof of enrollment, and they can also be a descendant. But if they if they're ever looking at doing any federal contracting. <coughs> We always want people to know they have to be from a federally recognized tribe and then be an enrolled citizen. We also are starting an artist directory on the Minnesota Native Artists Alliance. And uh, we will have a kind of like an online portfolio. We will not be selling for the artists, but what we will be doing is we will have their headshots, their product shots, and then kind of a little bio, and then also how to connect with the artist directly. So we will have that up very soon. And it's, uh, it's uh, minisotanativeartist.org. Yeah, that is incredible. Um, the next question is, what about personal tax protections when operating a business? What is the best way to learn what's needed? Okay, can you say that again? Because something... Yep, no problem. Um, I'll also put it in the chat again if it's easier to read it, but what about personal tax protections when operating a business? 
So what's the best way to learn what's needed? Some of that's going to depend on how you structure your business. It's, it's going to be very, I, you know, Mary Lundine might be able to answer that question better than I could. Um, if, you, if you're doing it as DBA, doing business as, um, then it's your personal income. I, with the LLC, I believe that you, I believe that that's personal when you incorporate then it's the corporation is taxed. And then you also have to pay tax for any income that you make from that corporation. But Mary might be able to explain that better than I just did. But maybe we could have Mary, Mary, just say a few words on that. Yeah. Tina, can you unmute Mary? I think I'm on, is this is Mary, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, when we talk about tax and liability, uh, there's maybe two, two trains of thought or two areas. One um, that Pamela, you were, you were mentioning when you decide what legal structure you want to establish, I usually do it, say you do it for two reasons. One is risk and the other is taxation. And so I think it's worth mentioning the risk part of it, which can, it's financial. Um, if you are a sole proprietor and you are sued, they can, the individual that sues you and you have to think about what's the worst thing I can get sued for. So what's the dollar amount, maximum dollar amount that I might be sued for. Um, anyways, they can go after the assets of your business and then they can go after your personal assets. So it goes beyond the business. If you become, if you establish a limited liability company or a corporation, um, just by the name, limited liability. It limits your personal liability. And if you were to get sued, they really can go only after the assets of the business, not your personal, like your home, your car, your children, your spouse, your, your savings. And the other reason you select a certain legal structure has to do with taxation. And usually, and a sole proprietor and limited liability company are taxed in the same way. You pay self-employment tax. It is about 15% of your net income. And self-employment tax, you would pay that. If you have a net income, you might pay it on a quarterly or an annual basis based on um, the records you've kept, what your revenues and expenses are, what's left over. Um, if you are a sole proprietor or a lim limited liability company, um, you would also take draws from the company and whatever your net income is, is what you pay taxes on. But it's usually lower um, if you are, and, and better for you, if you are a sole proprietor or limited liability company, if your net income is under $50,000 each year. And if you've got an accountant, let's say um, your revenues, your net income, not just your total revenues, but your net income um, grows and it's 50,000 for a year, two years. If you've got a good accountant, they'll say, hey, it's time for you to convert to a corporation. And tax wise, then that's better. So I hope I answered. So we talked about legal structures and risk and legal structures and taxation. Did I answer, so if I, if you have, did I answer that? Did I answer your question? Yes, was the response. Miigwech, Mary, for jumping on. She says, thank you. Um, yep. We have another question that came through the chat. And this is, this is a very good and interesting one. And I think we'll drive um, pretty good conversation with Pamela. So the question is, I'm a new small business owner in Moorhead, Minnesota. On my website, I identified my business as an indigenous woman owned business. And I'm wondering if that's ever been a hindrance to conducting business, should I not identify as a native owned business? You're on oh, mute. Pamela, you're mute. I know, I'm sorry. Will you, say, will you say that one more time? Definitely, I'll also put it in the chat to read with. Um, I'm a new small business owner in Moorhead, Minnesota. 
On my website, I identify as an Indigenous woman-owned business, and I'm wondering if that has ever been a hindrance to conducting business. Should I not identify as a Native-owned business? I feel like that's a real personal choice um, of that person, it, you know, to, uh, I mean, I would definitely say I was a native owned business. Um, I wouldn't have any qualms about it. Um, I, I think there's also, there's some advantages to being a native owned business, to being a woman owned business that can help you, uh, that gives you a better advantage as well. So I, I've never seen it as a hindrance. Um, you know, and it, if your business is very native centric, then your, your audience is very, you know, you, that's who you're gonna be selling to is if, it, if it's very native centric, then that's who your market is. But if you have a product that kind of crosses all boundaries, um, I, I guess I've never, um, again, I feel like that's really a personal choice that, that only you can make, um, you know, to say that, but I would encourage you to say that you're a native owned business because then you, you set a precedence for other native people that, you know, you, you become a person that inspires other people to take a step that maybe they've been afraid. But that's not your responsibility, but I'm just saying you inspire other people when you're open about who you are. Miigwech, Pamela, miigwech for the question. And I know just from my own experience um, that when we talk about, yay, I will continue to say I'm a native owned business. Yes, hashtag buy native everyone. Um, that in explaining like our product, um, to just, you know, general non-native, non-BIPOC, like potential financers or other community folk um, that they're like, oh, like we have a beaded logo pattern. They're like, you are only selling to other natives. And it's like, no, that's not in our, in our business plan. That's not in our financials. Like, like well, did you read them? <laughs> um, right? Like we are um, wanting and definitely very much wanting to serve um, and share with our community, um, but that is not our only, you know, we're not a niche company or a niche idea. So while I think that could be a hindrance just to having to take a step back and uh, re-explain to folks that you are open, you know, if it's retail, you know, you're open to everybody um, and whoever wants to participate with you as a customer um, and just being able and willing to just re-explain that every, you know, when you, when you need to. So we might be, you know, and this could be with our business plan too. We might be at step like 150 with our vision. Um, but sometimes we have to take, you know, the journey backwards to walk people through and bring them up to where we're at. If they might be at step like 25 or step 50. And Ivy in the chat did say um, she will be sending an email to all registrants with the video recording link. There will also be a survey link. The documents that Pamela has shared either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and looks like our friend there does have a very public business. Um, so hashtag buy native. Maniba has buy native stickers if you wanna promote. Um, there's a lot of good hearted people out there that, um, you know, aren't necessarily from our communities, but really want to kind of repair relations with us. And they can do that through, right, buying Native and buying BIPOC. Um, so we pray that, you know, all of those good hearted folks make their way into your, your business. Um, and from Susanna, she's saying thank you for sharing out the documents. Um, I'm going to put in the chat one more time if there's any other questions or feel free, Pamela, just some of the resources we've shared at the beginning about the one on one consulting opportunities for business advising and mentorship. And then I'll also put Andy Sturdivant's information for our artists. 
back in the chat that Ivy had shared and Pamela had referenced. And Danny, this is Ivy. So if you could, um, if you could share the resources with me, um, if you could email those to me, then I could put that in the email as well. So it's all in one spot. That is great. Yes, definitely. Miigwech, Ivy. Yeah, miigwech to you. Are there any other questions from the people, from the attendees? Um, we have a couple minutes left. I just want to quickly say, as if, if you're thinking about a asking a question, that um, so the American Indian Community Housing Organization hosted this session with um, Pamela Sanding and um, Miigwech Pamela and Miigwech to Danny, our, our um, moderator, facilitator, and Tina, our amazing Zoom tech volunteer. Uh, I, I do wanna say that uh, we, are, we are online uh, at www.aco.org. Um, and we also are on social media. So if you, um, um, want to learn more about ACO and how we support entrepreneurs and artists and things like that. I will also put that in, um, those, those links in, in, in the email that I send out to everybody, but I just kind of wanted to vocally say that to you all right now and say my thanks. Hey, Miigwech, Ivy. Um, another question had come through just about sharing out um, uh, a template, um, which will come in the documents that Ivy will forward. So I know with the Northland Small Business Development Center, um, there is a business planning template on our website, um, but I can download that and that can just be part of a toolkit that gets sent over. Um, some more from the chat. Um, iPhone says, I'm very interested in mentorship and resources in my area as well. I'm representing my Diné Nation. Yata, hey, uh, thank you. And we also have uh, more thanks from the chat. Um, if you're in Diné territory, um, you might want to look up the American or America's Small Business Development Centers. Uh, Robin would like to be mentored. She says, mentor me, please. Um, but those uh, um, small business development centers um, have that no cost advising and then the SCORE mentors are also no cost advising and you can sort of go through their um, directory for your region and kind of pick and choose who might be a good fit for your, for your business and for your, you know, what you're, what you're looking to do and they can link you up if you have a few. Um, oh, Danae in the Minnesota woodlands. You know what we call our uh, Ojibwe uh, Navajo, I have a few uh, relatives, we call them Chippehos. Um, <laughs> our Ojibwe uh, and uh, Dene uh, family. Um, and Pamela says from the chat, Wadu Miigwech, thank you for your patience and your generosity of time. Um, thank, thank you everybody. I, Pamela has been incredible um, in terms of the mentorship and leading the way and progressing and making paths forward for all of us together. Um, so I feel so, so privileged um, to be able to uh, be here with everyone and, and listen and learn with Pamela. Thank you, Pamela, for all that you do and all that you are. Well, it's been an honor to be here. I wish that I could do, I could have done more tonight, but it, it well, maybe we have to do a part two. Um, I'm putting my contact. If, if you have more questions, you can reach out to me at this email and I'm happy to answer questions. Also, if you have a business plan, um, one of the things that I do in my role with Maniba is I'm kind of the person that people will call me and maybe they're working through their marketing or their, uh, their numbers. I'm not a great I know what kind of things needed to be included, 
but I, I've always heard really amazing things about Mary Lundine and what an amazing, amazing um, business person she is and how she puts together the financials and the whole package. And so I want to encourage you to, you know, take advantage of what's in your community. And I know that we have other small business development centers in regions, um, you know, like the woman from Moorhead or the person from Moorhead. Um, that we do have other small business development centers. Some are better than others, but check them out and see if there's a person there that can help you. Um, if you have questions or if they're offering any trainings that you can take advantage of. And, um, but also I look at people's plans and sometimes we'll just be a second pair of eyes um, and make sure that they didn't miss something. Um, you know, to, um, I have a, a background in manufacturing, retail, um, international business. I was in international business for 16 years. I, I traveled all throughout Asia and South America. And it, it's what I love doing um, and those relationships. So thank you so much. Well, Tim McGuitch, I think this concludes our event for today. So I will pass it off to Ivy for any um, other closing reminders or remarks. Yeah, miigwech, Danny. Um, and miigwech to everyone that joined us tonight. Um, and uh, again, look for that email that I'll send out um, mostly, probably in the morning, um, early morning. Um, so um, best wishes to all your endeavors with um, creating your business plans and uh, reach out to the, to the resources that will be in the email that I send out to you. Um, and you can email Pamela, uh, Danny. Um, so there's, there's just so, so our community is uh, rich with um, so many people that are willing to help um, each other and be good relatives, as Pamela said. And so um, miigwech for joining us and I'm gonna sign off now and we'll, we'll be in touch, all right? Take care everyone and be well. Take care, Ivy. Yeah, you too, Pamela. <laughs>